welcome all the listeners, innovators, entrepreneurs, startups, industry people, public policy makers, academicians, vice chancellors, and others who are attending this special webinar. We have a special, wonderful guest today, Dr. Gopichan Katragada. Uh, he is the chief executive officer and founder of Myelin Foundry. Dr. Gopi uh, is a wonderful speaker, a technocrat, and and one of the most formidable person on innovation in corporates. So, uh, Gopi ji, uh, welcome uh, to this special webinar of Government of Gujarat uh, on behalf of IHAW, which is the flagship institution for building ecosystem in the state of Gujarat on innovation and entrepreneurship. I would also like to welcome Mr. M. Nagarajan, the Commissioner of Higher Education, Government of Gujarat, and Honorary Executive Director of IHAW. Uh, it is great to have both of you. Uh, and uh, uh, before I formally introduce Gopi to the, all the audience, I would like to have Nagarjan sir to share his initial remark and put the context uh, in this. Thank you. Thank you, Hiranmay, for putting at another wonderful session with a very eminent uh, person who is doing some cutting edge work, path breaking work. I am happy to welcome Dr. Gopi Chand Katragada on behalf of all the students, startups and innovators and also the mentors and the principals and other uh, assistant professors and teaching staff who are involved with the student startup and innovation policy across all colleges in Gujarat. This program aims to bring you in face to face with uh, eminent personalities who are doing cutting edge work and inspirational work in uh, innovation, startups and technology. In that way, we are having Dr. Gopi Chand uh, who has a very wide experience in corporate and other things uh, and also currently doing his own startup. So he's a very good inspiration for all of us to look at how startups and innovation can be done. He has also published uh, a wonderful book on innovation and uh, a lot of uh, patents and all. So I think we are going to get a lot of uh, insights from him today. Uh, to uh, put the thing in context, uh, Dr. Gopichan, the IHUB is part of the Student Startup and Innovation Policy, which is done by the Gujarat government. You will be uh, happy to note that, you know, Gujarat is the only state where three departments are having three different startup policies. One by the Industries Department, one by the Science and Technology Department, and third by the Education Department. And Education Department focuses on students who are in the 17 to 22, 25 age group. And uh, we are providing a sandbox environment for the students to actually uh, work on their ideas, the journey from mind to market that we are facilitating at an younger age so that the co social and economic cost of being a startup and being an entrepreneur and the cost of failure doesn't actually hurt the student but actually empowers him to do uh, further and also dream more. The target is to fund 1000 ideas every year and so far we have funded around 3000 ideas. Wow. And in the last three years uh, we have got a tremendous impact in terms of almost uh, 700 patents filed and uh, almost 200 patents have been accepted. And all these are from, not from any cities, but in tier two, tier three towns and even villages. We have uh, students from tribal talukas who have done wonderful uh, work. And we are very, very sector agnostic. Anything from uh, botany to zoology to technology to services is uh, truly uh, acceptable to us. And we fund the ideas and the Normal ticket size is like something around 50,000 to 2 lakh rupees. They approach the, any college which, who is a grantee institution under us and the idea is mentored by the professors and teachers also. So they get an access to resource, they have an institutional mechanism, they are anchored in the education system and they also get good uh, uh, exposure and support and mentorship. And then once they are in the higher level, we can give up to 20 lakh rupees of funding and uh, when the product is there into the market, then we connect them with angels and seed. That is the job that Hiranmay and his team is doing in IHUB. So basically we are the nursery for startups, you can say. And then once they are transplantable, we support them to go into higher uh, levels and probably risk capital ready uh, in the ecosystem. So what SSIP does is makes the ecosystem more inclusive, diverse and geographically dispersed. So that is the context where we really need your insights and inputs on how to take innovation in towards building an Atmanirbar Bharat where uh, we are looking at local solutions to local problems and also thinking uh, globally but acting globally. So we are trying to put all the slogans in practice in the college environment itself and uh, uh, we are just trying to increase the 
probably the failure rate of students so that they get um, forward with all the learnings and mature yeah. themselves as an entrepreneur as you will agree that being an entrepreneur is just knowing yourself first rest <laughs> everything will follow Right. So with these words, I now request Hiran Mai to do the honors uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Gopi. Thank you uh, so much, sir, for putting this context. Uh, Gopi, as uh, Mr. Nagarajan mentioned, Gujarat is the only state which has a very holistic approach of building startup ecosystem. So uh, it, it, it works across the spectrum. So all the departments in the government has a policy for innovation on financing. They have a forward integration. They have a backward integration. And our entire ecosystems backward integration slam into educational ecosystem. So Gujarat produces 1.5 million students from 85 universities of the department in which Mr. Nagarajan is the commissioner. And these universities are the harbinger of innovation and creativity. So that was one of the region to, uh, uh, to start the innovation process from academia, then take help of industry and take this thing forward. And none other than you could really guide us how the innovation ecosystem works in industry and also how innovations matters in the strategic role. So having said that, I will formally introduce Dr. Gopichan Kapragada to all the listeners on Facebook and the university live pages today. Dr. Gopi is the founder and CEO of Mylan Foundry. It's an AI company with a vision to transform human experience and outcomes in wellness and media and entertainment. He is an independent director of Boss India Limited. He is also the Vice President of IET, Board of Trustees UK, and member of NASCOM Governing Council for Center of Excellence for Data Science and AI. Till January 2019, Dr. Gopi was the Group Chief Technology Officer and Innovation Head of Tata Sons. At Tata Sons, he facilitated the development of pioneering product and services, strategic technology collaboration, and innovation across the 100 billion US dollar Tata Group. Previously, I was the Chairman and Managing Director of G India Technology Center, where I first met Gopi with Rasani Gupta years back. I finally remember the conversation that we had on how we do innovations in this country. He helped grow G's largest R&D center, the John F. Well Technology Center, to be the, among the world's leading intellectual property generation. By the way, uh, knowledge economy doesn't uh, try without deep R&D and translational research to take it market and protecting through intellectual property right. And Dr. Gopi was the person who pioneered that to happen in the technology research in corporates. Gopi is the past chairman of CII National Technology Committee and CII Western Region Innovation Task Force. He is a G certified Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Gopi helped establish the Advanced Material Center of Excellence at IIT Madras and Advanced Manufacturing Center of Excellence at IIT Kharagpur. He was trained as the CII Tata's Communication Digital Transformation COE. Gopi also set up and managed the ongoing Tata research collaboration with Harvard and Yale. Gopi has authored a book on innovation titled SMAS, currently in its second edition. I must say all of you should go through it. He has over 30 journal publications, five patents, several invited presentations, and citation of his research to home. Dr. Gopi holds a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Electronic Engineering from Bangalore University. MS and PhD degrees in electric engineering from Loa State University. And Dr. Gopi is a person who has gone through the highest among the ranks in the corporates to drive innovation. And now he also turns agile and lean and try to build his own dream through his own startup. None other than him could have been, you know, be more seducing to all of us who are so comfortable with our own role in government or private systems. But sometimes people like Dr. Gopi become an inspiration to all of us that there is no limit to ambition. You can still dream any moment and build dreams of your own. Having said that, Dr. Gopi, uh, I would like to welcome to this entire uh, audience of Gujarat, all of the students who are listening through different university web pages and the Facebook Live on iHub. I am grateful to have you today. And I don't understand between the people who want to listen to you and the source of our today. Dr. Gopi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hiran Mai. Uh, I'll just share my presentation just a second. 
I think you will be able to see the slide. Siran Mai, that was a wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you. And uh, Mr. Nagarajan, uh, Gujarat is lucky to have you as their commissioner for higher education. Uh, this is really awesome that uh, you as an IAS officer have such a focus on innovation and especially student startup and innovation and the policies which uh, govern it. Siran Mai, of course, I uh, remember yourself and uh, Professor Anil Gupta, Professor Anil Gupta, and uh, passion in uh, across Gujarat. Um, I have uh, had the good fortune to uh, visit uh, uh, Gujarat uh, in the uh, with the topic of innovation. Uh, uh, multiple universities. We also leveraged uh, the university system there. I have employees who are from the Nirma University. I just love the uh, students from there. And of course, the faculty must be great. Um, the uh, quality of the students uh, give that respect to the faculty as well. So today I'm happy to be talking about innovation. I thought since it is a student audience largely and an academic audience, I will be happy to be talking about careers uh, in innovation. And in, as part of that, I will talk about India, uh, which is what uh, Mr. Nagarajan also talked about. How do we put action behind slogans? And the only kind of slogan which works is the, uh, the slogan which has been put into practice. Let's see how that uh, can be uh, done as well. So India, it's my dear country. It's your dear country. We need to lead on innovation. There is no two ways about it. It's our time and we have that opportunity. We will partner with every region and every nation and every continent of this world. But really, it is our role, our time right now to lead on uh, innovation. And there is a reason uh, for it. You think about China. China has not only the ability to scale, they have the scale. However, China has the difficulty of reputation. They do not have the same kind of uh, inclusive reputation that India can uh, garner. You look at a country like Israel, which has done wonderfully well on basis of their assertiveness and their assertiveness probably comes from the fact that early on the students are sent into the army before they come back and do their undergraduate studies. And so by the time they come out of their undergraduate studies, they're confident. So we uh, need to learn from that. At the same time, Israel does not have a market. They have to look outside for market. A country like UK can be a great uh, partner. They have a great manufacturing culture. They are a great manufacturing uh, hub. The kind of energy that we have in, in India based on the demographic that we have, that is difficult to find elsewhere, anywhere in the world. And definitely also in UK, they could leverage the kind of energy that we bring on. US is a great country, has great innovation because of its uh, diversity. But it is going through political turmoil and it will look to India to take on a lot of the uh, weight on innovation that it has been uh, shouldering. So again, I state India has all the ingredients to become a global driver of innovation. It is also a responsibility for us to become a global driver of innovation because we also have the strong market potential 1.3 billion people driving a market, an excellent talent pool, the people who are on the call today uh, are an example, and an underlying culture of frugal uh, innovation. So frugal innovation is a topic which is much discussed. I'll give you my flavor of frugal innovation. Frugal innovation is innovation which is responsible, and it is not just about money. So let's move to the ingredients of what it will take to lead on innovation. You as individuals also need to be responsible, just like corporations and organizations have to be responsible. And I think we have that. We have that more than anyone else, uh, the culture of service to the society. We are creative. We are idea people. Uh, we need to be multidisciplinary technology champions. Uh, Mr. Nagarajan talked about the fact uh, that uh, his organization is not looking at any particular area for excellence. Uh, it is across the board. And that is what will take creativity to the right uh, place. Um, one of the areas that we need to continue to work on is to be hands on. We are way too theoretical. So if I were to pick one area on this chart that we need to work on more is to be hands on. We need to be close to the data. We need to be close to the customer. We need to be on the equipment. We need to be in the chips. We need to be inside the data. 
so increase intelligence in how and what we make is the only way we are going to break free from the shackles that we have put on ourselves over generations of looking down upon hands on work hands on work is not to be looked down upon it is the only way for us to progress uh, in this environment of uh, innovation we need to be change agents we need to reimagine businesses in an analog digital world but we also need to reimagine businesses in a world which has been given a warning by the environment in multiple ways uh, we have seen it across in recent times including uh, covid we need to think about impact and impact local yes but globally pioneering and global impact as well so this is what i would like to uh, dive into over the next few charts but the message is very clear it is our time to lead it is our time to lead on uh, innovation and i am not giving up the baton to you as young innovators i am willing to be part of it if you will lead i will follow otherwise i will lead it's your choice to make india has had a rich heritage of innovation so if anybody has doubts uh, as to whether india can innovate uh, like the best of the best in the world here are some examples and i'll start with history but go into the present and into the future as well the wood steel is a fantastic steel the first carbon steel ever made in the world um and the uh, steel was used for many things um including making of the damascus swords just like the arabic numerals which are hindu numerals the damascus swords is a misnomer it is made from woods steel which is a corruption of the word ukku and this is scholarly it is not a proud indian trying to take credit for something not theirs uh, it is well established that this steel the carbon steel which could bend 90 degrees at the hilt if made into a sword and at the same time have the strength to cut through logs of wood this steel was indian steel it was the only place where, where uh, uh, the steel was exported from the carbon steel from 500 bc to 1500 ad that was not a small amount of time so we were really able to do that for a long time materials advantage was an advantage that we had as far as innovation was concerned that beautiful patterns that you see in the close up of the sword is the signature of the wood steel many a researcher many a scientist have dived deep and uh, searched wide to find how the steel was made uh, some answers and a lot of questions uh, still remain uh, what is known is that there were traces of impurity in the steel which was produced which could have probably come to uh, come to it from the ore or it was added later Later, as an example, vanadium was an impurity which was present in this uh, steel, which gave its characteristic uh, signature pattern, but also its ability to be flexible and strong at the uh, same time. Much before was the Indus Valley and the culture, which is close to where you are right now in Gujarat. I have visited Lothal, I have visited Dolavira, and if you have not, that is our opportunity to visit Indus Valley, and it is uh, fast being ransacked by all the visitors. So before the richness of the site. Uh, disappears and lothal is already clean and uh, no sign of any of the history um, but dolavira is still there uh, do respect it when you visit but visit the indus dancing girl is the epitome of uh, bronze making which has lived on to this day in the chola bronzes the technique probably has not changed anything much which is also the technique used in investment casting in the uh, industry in addition to the technology aspect it's also beautiful work of art uh, the fact that the uh, measurements of the lady uh, are not perfect they are more realistic uh, is a sign of a very advanced uh, culture when you begin art you make everything perfect when you know that the world is imperfect your art also reflects it and the beauty of the imperfections is what is the crowning glory of the best of best artists so this is not only advanced technology it is very advanced art more recently tipu's rockets are an advanced uh, steel making technique which enable packing enough gunpowder to carry uh, bayonets into the skies and come down on the enemy ranks uh, swirling and uh, had resulted in the 
defeat of the british twice at the hands of uh, tipu of course eventually he was defeated uh, and um, the technology was taken by congreve to uk and improved upon by using newtonian mechanics and used in napoleonic wars and uh, various other places by the way surprisingly this painting is not from the napoleonic wars this is from the wars in the us uh, but all modern day rocketry which means a rocket which can carry a payload goes back to these rockets which were made by tipu's uh, men's uh, men in uh, 1799 and that uh, time period what is this this is a shloka of course but it is more than that if i were to translate this into english from sanskrit it would still read the same maki baki paki dhaki naki naki and so on other than the last phrase kala ardha jha which is a quarter of a sign table so this shloka was a way for folks during aryabhatta's time and this is his shloka from aryabhatta to memorize the entire sign table most of you are engineers you know how the sign table looks i'll show it to you also but this is how the math worked for this uh, shloka so there is a formula which is used uh, and there is numeric values associated with the consonants and the vowels the vowels are used as uh, expo- 10 to the power of the vowel and the consonants are used as a multiplier and each word hence ends up with a numeric value and those numeric values in turn using a formula results in signs in intervals of 3.75 degrees and you can see those which have manually calculated in the text and in the table which is from the excel spreadsheet and there is not much of a difference 3.75 degrees sign off is 0.06 0.065464 and 0.065403 that's the difference between excel and the sign table from a shloka and the entire sign table which looks like this is codified into that uh, shloka of course pi of course the distance between the earth and the moon the circumference of the earth the diameter of the earth all of those in multiple decimal points were um, stored in form of a shloka for reasons of intellectual property protection because for the longest time until 500 ad we did not write down sanskrit we only passed it on from mouth to ear but also uh, for from a standpoint of how the language developed and how that uh, uh, we developed we developed as people with uh, uh, an interest in using memory and um, rather than write down the sign table we memorized the whole thing uh, using our uh, memory india can deliver technology today also and like hiran mai said i led a wonderful organization it was my privilege to do that um, and the organization was ge and while ge today struggles and struggles globally uh, the organization in india continues to do well and deliver technology for ge across the world and ge struggle is also temporary because it's a great organization and it will come out every organization goes through tough times but just look at the history of uh, ge 150 years of electric education and uh, revenue and uh, creating wealth for not just itself as a company but for the nation it was part of the united states of america so these technologies that i'm displaying here are technologies that uh, we produced in ge in india completely from idea to the market so in the oil and gas industry we produce the ability to look at flow in oil and gas pipes and determine the uh, multiple phases of the fluid which is going through oil water sand whatever uh, we developed the ability to do biomass gasification in the most efficient ways in order to leverage india's biomass and the capability of india to produce 18 gigawatts of uh, power wind turbines for low wind regimes india is a low wind regime country but once we produced it for india everybody else uh, wanted it smaller aircraft engines for the regional transportation uh, which we need and Uh, which is going to be a growing uh, area locomotives for india locomotives for the region um, the healthcare uh, which matters is the healthcare which is inclusive and we develop products which are based on the india market be it um, the ecg machine or be it the baby uh, warmer and this is the example of the baby warmer it's not only a story of taking technology 
and uh, making sure that we are using only what is needed in the market but we also developed it based on inputs from the market we had nurses giving us inputs on what makes sense um, the image on the left is the high end baby warmer very um, advanced technologically the image next to it is the india baby warmer and it does everything which needs to be done um, and it does it comfortably um, the baby needed to be uh, uh, placed into the crib sideways um, rather than head first uh, which was the previous uh, case so we gave more room and openness in the direction where the nurses wanted to place the baby from we moved the heating element back but we used a parabolic mirror to uniformly heat the uh, area where the baby was kept by the way the image shows one baby in the crib in indian hospitals three babies are placed in the crib so we needed to be more uh, sure that the heating was uniform and it was across the entire crib otherwise we would have problems with the poor babies who were on the outside uh, edges um, but that doesn't end there in order to bring in phototherapy which is treatment for babies with jaundice instead of putting it all into the same equipment and making making it much more complicated than it requires to be and in the process advancing the technology we used leds which provide the specific frequency which enable us to treat jaundice and not expose the baby to unwanted radiation this was the first time anywhere in the world that we were able to manufacture such capability which also rolled just over the baby and provided the required treatment uh, in a cost effective way in a technologically advanced way obviously everybody across the world wanted something uh, like this once we produced it for uh, india uh, not only this my tata uh, examples are examples of uh, we did a lot within the tata group uh, during my time where we were leading globally pioneering products including factory safety wearables including fuel cells for india the, uh, uh, dispensing drones for agriculture um, and uh, Uh, graphene as a material produced from lakka uh, which is the silac all of this uh, from our uh, labs using multiple tata group companies and using my own team uh, to stitch together the idea and the engineering capabilities but we also Uh, collaborated with the globe and the indian academics um, at the most advanced uh, level network sciences which were working on social uh, media data uh, we were working on soft robotics uh, and core robotics uh, advanced materials and the ability to develop them in a much shorter time gut microbiome and the experiments needed to uh, look at uh, the uh, ways to get the treatment of the gut as well if your gut is not in the right state your physical health and mental health is not in the right state the mice that you see in this video are mice which are germ free and these mice we we didn't produce here in india so we used yale's labs wonderful labs but we tested our products um, using uh, their uh, capabilities and um, also very advanced deep learning techniques uh, for communications and various other aspects so we not only drove technology from india for india for the globe but we also the ultimate test whether you are a great innovative country is your ability to fund and collaborate globally so do not get lulled into the feeling that everything needs to happen within our boundaries um, that is uh, myopic thinking and that will only stunt uh, our ability to contribute and grow innovatively okay so now many of you are engineers i'm assuming and i wanted to spend some time on things which we do well and things that we need to get better at engineering in order to innovate you need at least these three pillars engineering foundations engineering mindset and execution these are three different things some people might have one some people might have two but really what is needed as an engineer is all three there is no other way to be an engineer and be an innovative engineer than have all these three and uh, these three in all its glory and there is no there are no exceptions you have to be good at these things to be an engineer having an engineering degree is of no use if you cannot put it into practice and the way you will put it into practice for india in a way that matters and like i said it is our time and the way you will make 
us able to lead on innovation is by being good at all of this no exceptions so we are good at theoretical fundamentals when it comes to engineering foundation we need to put in a lot more effort on developing hands on expertise we are a good at component level attention to detail we need to put in a lot more effort on system level thinking we are good on quality and cost consciousness we need to be a lot better on documenting and creating design practices so that the future generations learn uh, and build uh, engineering heritage which is the reason why uh, or countries like uh, the uk have grown from strength to strength because they build from generation to generation and we do not document anything and if there was a lacuna that you need to completely and irreversibly address it is the ability to write down write down write down now many of you are in a startup hub and it's my joy to say that in this chart even though it is small our ideas for several hundreds of startups if not thousands and the way to think about this chart is you need to look at it one from right to left which is from trends to the technology and that's where you need to start because 80% of uh, startup ideas will come by meeting market needs market needs are in turn driven by uh, geopolitical and consumer trends so these days the geopolitical trend is pandemic these days the geopolitical trend is social distancing and how does it impact the uh, needs of let's say mobility the needs of immersive entertainment the needs of early health uh, and uh, uh, going into the future how does it make itself permanently ensconced in moving from mobility to virtual presence moving from early health to being able to prevent even uh, disease uh, being uh, uh, potential so these are the things that you need to think about first which is what is the current market need that you will want to address what is the future market need that you want to prepare for and think about the first chart which i put up uh, what is it that i do to be responsible as i continue to look into these areas mobility is about transportation it's about freight um, it's about moving things it is about moving people how do i do it and do i need to do it so if it is about moving people are there ability to create the same kind of experiences through part uh, physical presence but part virtual presence uh, if freight needs to move what is the ai capabilities that will pick the uh, closest place for the minimum logistics and uh, so on and so forth so that is being responsible that's being uh, conscious about climate change in the uh, geopolitical trends similarly every area that is on this chart but how come i say that uh, you can create um, hundreds of companies from this is because you have a way to combine biology computing and materials and uh, create multiple ideas for multiple needs and multiple degrees of solving that uh, needs uh, can you use uh, genomics in mobility of course you can uh, genomics can be used uh, to provide health uh, monitoring health while the person is seated in the car um, uh, and uh, uh, can you use uh, deep learning in mobility of course you can uh, you can use it in multiple ways you can make make uh, uh, recommendations for the kind of music he is listening in the car or news he is listening or she is listening while uh, driving but also what kind of restaurants are on the way and which ones maybe he or she can uh, stop uh, given the last meal they ate uh, the uh, meal preferences their health um, and uh, their uh, meeting time next meeting time and maybe they have to have a light stomach whatever it might be so there are so many ideas in this chart and i'm happy to have hiran my uh, share it uh, with you um, but what you need to understand is that as technologists it is not enough to know technology you need to understand the market you need to understand geopolitical and uh, consumer uh, trends and like mr nagarajan said biology is important computing is important and materials is important computing everybody knows and everybody is on top of um, materials people might think it is old but materials like graphene will make the old new a thin layer a single uh, atom layer of graphene can uh, create a huge difference for how much steel is needed in an application 
biology it is going to be the age of biology there is no engineer who can say i do not know biology or i do not understand biology you cannot do that you need to know biology you need to know all the latest and greatest happenings in uh, biology and you can engineers have learn to learn and uh, that is our skill and that is what we need to uh, keep good at again from a standpoint of building your careers uh, what you know today is important but uh, the ability to learn is what will build your careers uh, if you get ever into a zone the where you feel that you know quite a bit of what needs to be known that is the start of your end as a technologist as an engineer as an innovator uh, you will not exist within a very few months if not uh, uh, that a very few years so i wanted to talk a little bit deeper on a subject which uh, which is of interest to everyone at this point of time um it is an intersection of computing it is an intersection of biology it is an intersection of materials as well and we'll talk about how uh, it all comes to uh, gather so i want to talk about ai so artificial intelligence which means first let's understand human intelligence and where ai fits in ai is here not to replace humans it cannot replace human intelligence human intelligence is more complex than we can ever imagine all of you have heard of iq the intelligent intelligence quotient um, it is usually ancestrally inherited and further built upon by our efforts if we don't use our iq it will drop for sure but really uh, we come primed uh, with some amount of that from our ancestors in our uh, dna emotionally co emotional quotient also some of you would have heard about it uh, it is about making ourselves sensorially tuned so that uh, from our experiences we build an ability to listen and understand an ability to uh, sense and react an ability to be there and an ability to be now and an ability to work in teams and an ability to produce in uh, teams also there is hq and like i said one of the areas that we need to build in india is the ability to use our hands better and that is what is hand quotient i am calling it it doesn't come in any book so it is experientially learned but also what is bq bq is the other intelligence which i talked about a little bit which is bacterial and which is present in our gut in our cavities of all kinds on our skin and any uh, place that you can think of you will have bacterial ecosystem living and actually helping us and that is our environment saying here is my knowledge and i am sharing it with you and that is symbiotically received there is no competition for this kind of intelligence from any source of computing um, at the same time ai computers can do many things much better than us there is no question because they can do it fast they can work on lots of data and um, they can do things which we can never dream of doing in our entire lifetime in terms of computation but that doesn't mean that they are replacing us replacing our decisions replacing our responsibilities and uh, that is something for us to accept and use the ai as a tool that is the best way to do it there are enough people trying to scare folks around ai i am not one of uh, those i think that any technology can have two edges it is up to us and we have eventually learned how to use it in a manner that will be useful uh, we need to also use it in a manner which is uh, responsible so ai can codify rules so if there are rules uh, you can codify them and uh, use tree based logic uh, or fuzzy logic uh, or you can query data if you have lots of data similarity queries as an example or you can use ai and machine learning uh, like deep learning uh, however you do not have generically intelligent systems uh, gpt3 which has been much touted by open ai uh, comes from folks who also um, have uh, uh, singularity university and various other uh, kind of uh, uh, i would say visionary at the same time uh, james bond kind of uh, an approach uh, to technology um i have nothing against that other than for the fact that uh, it's going to take a long time and it's not required at this point of time to have generically intelligent system so if you want to solve the problem of face recognition you solve the problem of face recognition if you try to solve that and the problem of um, let's uh, say 
transmitting video uh, then you do not need that number one and it's not going to uh, work uh, and uh, it's going to create very funny uh, results um, also and that doesn't mean you should stop working on it and what i'm saying is that uh, there is no need to try and uh, uh, replace human beings and uh, uh, then try to create scare tactics around that. So we need to use technology as tools and uh, we need to make sure that we are responsible with it. Episodic memory, AI doesn't have. Emotion, AI doesn't have. You can program emotion, yes. But as soon as you say you can program emotion, emotion is unprogrammed reactions. So hence, AI doesn't have emotion. Creativity, it can interpolate. If you can give it thousand pictures of uh, Picasso, it can make a new picture, which is Picasso-like, but it cannot create a new form of art, right? So limited in that way. These limitations are all going to go at some point of time and we'll be able to further leverage uh, this tool. But do not get carried away with uh, AI's capabilities. It is there, it is important, it can do a lot of stuff. But at the same time, it's still a tool in the hands of humans who have to behave in a responsible fashion. So what is AI? And some of you are very good at it. I've got some really good uh, folks from Nirma University who we have interacted with and uh, who are part of our organization. And uh, we continue to work uh, internship and otherwise. Uh, really learned a lot from them as students as well. So whoever their professors are, uh, congratulations uh, to you. You're doing great work for us in India to be able to produce such wonderful students. So my explanation is for the lay person amongst you, uh, uh, trying to get across AI. So biologically, a neuron is a very simple computational uh, node uh, in the biological system. Uh, it aggregates information, it uh, passes it through some form of a non-linearity and pa passes it further on. Um, and the strength hence of a biological neuron is not the neuron itself, but it's massive interconnectivity. So also mathematical neuron. Uh, we have tried to replicate that uh, behavior. We aggregate inputs, we multiply it by uh, weights, we offset it by biases, we pass it through a non-linearity. Um, and uh, uh, this we pass it on through a massive uh, network. And in this massive network, the neural network tries to learn from inputs and outputs provided during the training phase and stores weights, which will enable uh, it to provide the outputs when given inputs it has not seen before as well. So that is in a simple way a neural network. But if you look at WI XI plus B, it is the equation of a line. It can draw lines uh, in multidimensional space. Um, in multiple layers, it can draw surfaces in multidimensional spaces. So it can separate classes so it can classify. It can morph from one surface to another so it can morph faces or it can uh, morph outcomes. Uh, so that is the nature of a neural network. It's very mathematical, it's not scary. It is lines and surfaces in multidimensional space, but it does wonderful things, no doubt about it. I just want to remove the scare of neural networks. What is happening recently is computational power has increased so much that you can do whatever you want. Previously, we would use only three layers to conserve computation and because beyond three layers, after you get lines and surfaces, the uh, further improvements on adding more and more layers is minimal. But now we will take that minimal increase also. But we also, because we have the ability computationally, we have added convolution neural networks. Uh, so previously we would extract features. If we have an image, uh, we would not be able to compute. So we had to extract minimum features from the image and feed it. Today, we don't have to do it. The convolution network actually uh, figures out what features it needs in an expanded way um, before it compresses it uh, because it has the computation to do it. Each layer of the convolution uh, neural network looks at a different level of abstraction, um, be it lines or uh, uh, shadows or colors and so on and so forth. Um, so it uh, picks out whatever it needs for the task which it has been given based Based on the inputs and outputs that it has been uh, provided. So this is the deep neural network which has made so much progress in the last five years, which is why you are using so much. You are hearing so much about uh, neural networks. It can do wonderful things. Today it can do multi-dimensional signal analysis classification. 
pattern uh, mapping, automation of analysis, all used in factories uh, quite a bit. Uh, it can implement rules. Um, it can recognize uh, patterns and images. Uh, it can do natural language processing, voice recognition, and image recognition. These three last areas are the reason, again, from an application standpoint, why neural networks have become so prominent. You can speak to your machine yeah, and hence do voice recognition. You can mine the social media and get sentiments uh, about your company and hence the natural language processing is important. Um, you can recognize all kinds of images, be it non-destructive evaluation image to understand whether a thermal image is uh, uh, reflecting a, a potential flaw in the boiler tube or you can recognize a face um, and you can do it very, very, very well. Um, and what is coming next, and we are part of it also, video streaming, game streaming, uh, democratizing visual effects, uh, recommendation engine, voice matching, dubbing, vernacular media, uh, chatbots you've already seen, but really I'm not very happy with where we are. Uh, recently, uh, I was interacting with a chatbot from uh, one of the airlines. Uh, it's not very smart at all. It just uh, does simple searches and throws hundreds of options which don't make sense in a crisis uh, situation. Maybe in a normal day, uh, you can do it, but then you don't need a chatbot for that. You can do a search outside of the uh, chatbot. So a lot of things are happening, health and wellness, automotive applications, such as driver behavior, agricultural spray, spraying, again, which we had been involved in. But some of the knowledge uh, jobs are going to change. They'll not be eliminated, but legal process automation. If you have something which is knowledge, you can extract that knowledge using natural language processing and uh, parse it in a way that it will give you the right kind of outcomes given a situation. And adaptive learning is uh, the ability of uh, online learning, for example, to uh, give the best learning experience for each individual, which is different from every other uh, individual. So here are examples of face recognition. We are able to do it so well so quickly because not only do we have the data, 3 million faces open source, but we also have the code behind it open source. So you can modify it and use it uh, uh, very readily. So here's an example where uh, employee of ours, side pose, many years younger, no specs, is recognized right in the middle of the other picture along with other people, even though it has seen only one picture. Right, so uh, this is miraculous, trust me, uh, for people who, like me, have been working on AI from 1990. Uh, it's just amazing for us to be able to see these kinds, these kinds of outcomes. I don't know if you're able to see, but on the left is a particular uh, video of a low resolution, and on the right, uh, we have upscaled the resolution on the edge device, uh, which for us means the phone, um, and uh, we uh, go from a certain number of pixels to much, much higher number of pixels, uh, but also the quality is also uh, improved. It's uh, not in scale to the number of pixels added, but it's considerably uh, improved. What does this mean? It means I can send across small files um, uh, and let it journey through the internet, uh, use less bandwidth, use less carbon, uh, use less storage, and again, use less carbon for that, uh, and use less versions of the uh, uh, video stored and on the edge create the uniform uh, user uh, experience uh, we can do many more things we can do rotoscopy automatically and uh, the video app i'm on for example i can put a different screen than my home today uh, it doesn't do it well we can do it much better using ai we can do vernacular languages which are low resources english there's so much work which has happened that um, there's no need for us to further work there but uh, indian languages were Vernacular languages we might need to work. Uh, we can do live detection of objects and use it for uh, various things, including advertisement and recommendation engines. We can do healthcare again. All of these examples I'm showing you, by the way, past two few slides are ours, which we have worked on and which we have uh, developed. Um, so be it uh, COVID or be it uh, a chronic in disease, it's an inflammatory disease. COVID is acute inflammation um, and heart attack, for example, is an outcome of chronic inflammation. So the ability to measure the inflammatory state uh, today resides in blood. Um, but if we can train a network based on non-invasives um, at the input and blood outcomes at the output and be able to predict inflammatory state, uh, we will be able to 
very quickly on a wearable platform, provide information which is useful to pre predict and prevent as well as in case of acute in uh, illnesses such as infectious diseases, uh, determine whether somebody needs further tests. So we'll not be able to tell whether a person has COVID or pneumonia, but if the inflammatory state is such that uh, the person needs a further test, we can. And once the test comes back positive, and then we need to un understand the course of treatment. Again, uh, AI and the sensor combination can uh, provide uh, support. Um, this is the same uh, information uh, uh, showing the details of the kind of information that we are using. Uh, eyes, tongue, pictures of them, uh, sensors looking at heart rate, sensors looking at bioimpedance, and also picking up the voice. So that's what I had to share. Uh, uh, happy to have uh, shared uh, that content. Uh, so I'm uh, Hiranmay, if it is okay for a few questions, I'm happy to take. Absolutely, sir. I, I think it was wonderful. I, uh, I will take some questions for you. So the question is, how do we create an ecosystem for a more deep technology research and taking that deep technology research into enterprises? Yeah, so a few things. Um, I think uh, it's a sequential thing. It's a uh, maturing thing. But the deep technology requires a lot of patience. It requires patience from the founders. It requires patience from the investors. And it requires some experience. Um, and uh, uh, so one way to do it is for the government, for example, to uh, have programs which will offset the risk uh, which is there in deep tech. Um, uh, but I do not believe that is the way to do it. I believe that uh, the way to do it is a program called Small Business Innovative Research, which is there in the US, uh, and I've recommended it uh, to the uh, government. Uh, what it is, is the government agencies need technology. For example, we are working on technology for national security, and that requires deep technology. So to provide the startups an opportunity to solve those problems uh, is a way to uh, remove uh, some of the financial and risk obstacles from the government side. From an entrepreneur side, I think um, what is critical is to develop that depth of knowledge. Uh, so do not be in a hurry. Uh, you know, it takes time. I've seen a lot of depth of knowledge coming out of uh, Gujarat, uh, the students there, even undergrad students. Um, and uh, so to be able to uh, take that and uh, you know, uh, work patiently uh, is the second aspect from the entrepreneur side. There's not going to be a unicorn created in three years. Uh, in order to establish a deep tech company, it will take eight years. Right. So do you need do you have that uh, patience as an entrepreneur? You will not make any money for eight years. Do you have that uh, patience uh, as an entrepreneur? So from an entrepreneur standpoint, that is the uh, what is required. And then there is um, uh, venture capital money and venture capital capitalists are using other people's money. Uh, so they need to be able to show the outcomes and the potential of exit. And hence, um, venture capitalists will invest only when you're able to get uh, a deep tech company. Either you have already built your reputation uh, and hence you're able to attract the venture capitalist confidence or you have built the product and you're able to uh, get the venture capitalists uh, uh, to engage. So I hope at three levels, those are the different ways of looking uh, at it. But India does need deep tech companies and we need a participation from all three, the government, but use grants to solve your own problems for the government, which means that the outcome from the uh, startup will be useful to the government. Don't just give free money. Um, it is not enough uh, to do that. Uh, from the entrepreneur, think about eight years if you want to be in deep tech. And from venture capitalists uh, is take little more risk. Uh, and uh, at least those which have demonstrated uh, do not wait for some global VC to uh, you know first sign off and then you sign off. Wonderful. Uh, sir, uh, just to add on to that, uh, there are a lot of translational research, particularly uh, when in the Department of Education when we drive innovation. Uh, we have more than 85 universities uh, and all of them are equipped with a decent amount of R&D infrastructure. And there is a certain degree of research happening and there are certain tra tra translational research happening. How universities need to make strategy yeah. to take these translational research beyond lab and, and get something out of it? 
Yeah. See, we have worked with the university system and the government to create programs such as Uchchatar Avishkar Yojana and the Imprint program. Uh, these are programs. Uchchatar Avishkar Yojana actually mandates the participation of uh, industry. Uh, imprint program uh, doesn't mandate, but it encourages the participation of industry. Now, when we think about universities, we need to look at it this way: uh, that the industry R&D should work 80% on uh, work uh, and research, which will enter the market in three years. Uh, and 20% for three to five years, maybe in India. And the other way, in the case of university, 80% of the work universities do should be something which will enter the market only three to five years, if not seven years. Um, and 20% uh, will still be uh, work which enters the market in zero to three years. But uh, really, that cannot be the uh, focus nor the uh, vision of the university. So the way you get uh, you get to the right mix is uh, recognize where we are. So, for example, Ohio State University says that we are uh, still growing in terms of our uh, innovation capability. So we will not put a lot of load on IP and so on and so forth on the industry and scare the industry away. Uh, I don't think Indian uh, academics should worry about IP. Uh, IP is monetizing of uh, the uh, uh, commercial outcomes of the uh, research. If it is funded entirely by the industry, uh, the in this uh, academic world should acknowledge that um, that we are as. By the way, I also teach. I have also taught in the U.S. and here, and I know that where we need to go as academics is to acknowledge that we need to grow in maturity on uh, our uh, research. So take all the industrial uh, fund. Funding which comes, take the government funding, um, and uh, do try uh, try to uh, uh, endeavor to have that mix where academic world should focus on the longer term. If not, the country forever will be stuck in the short term. Wonderful, uh, Dr. Gopi. One 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 uh, policy level uh, dialogue which is happening these days in the country when a new education policy has come up is to restructure the research funding. To reorganize the entire game and uh, create something like NSF in India or something like that. So uh, you have seen the research and innovation in US in the federal funding system. In the context of new education policy argument, how do you see the best roadmap we should do? Yeah. So. Um... NSF like organizations already exist in India. They like, for example, you can take uh, um, CSIR and make it uh, uh, a combination NSF and uh, uh, ability to deliver uh, technology, right? So I'm not a big fan of adding more and more agencies. I think we have enough agencies. Um, we need to use a different model. See, once uh, at the at a point of time when we created something like CSIR, we needed to create jobs. So we did a lot of job creation, um, and now uh, CSIR can take some of the funds and uh, use it for uh, you know creating true innovations uh, and um, uh, globally pioneering uh, innovation. By the way, they have done it. They have done it in the world of. Uh, uh, chemical engineering and uh, Dr. Marshalkar uh, has led that effort. Thanks to him, uh, we have a lot to show for and many others like him have followed. Uh, however, we need to do a lot more. If you look at uh, like to your point, how much of that has translated uh, into uh, the uh, market, um, we can aspire for uh, more. Um, so the roadmap for something uh, which the government uh, can do is number one uh, have a program for startups like i mentioned sbir have a program for uh, large companies uh, so uh, much of the uh, technologies that we buy from outside have a long term program for that to develop it in india fund the large companies to do it don't expect the large companies will fund it they will not fund it. They do not have the risk appetite. right? So at least fund it 50% and assure the market afterwards. So one is do real work with the uh, industry. Uh, the other aspect um, uh, from a government standpoint is what they have done. And also we have provided a lot of input in making the education policy focus more on experiential learning and creating people who do not have uh, hesitation using their hands.
Wonderful. You, you rightly mentioned, you also teach in U.S. universities uh, as a faculty and also seen Indian academia very closely. You have seen the research both sides, innovation happening both sides. What is the one thing or two things that you will mention which we miss in our DNA uh, to match a global class of outcome? Yeah. So uh, I'll tell you the difficulty is not just in the academic world. Number one, we need a lead market. So if I'm producing something globally pioneering and uh, the ecosystem here is not willing to pay for it, uh, it is not the best way to uh, create an environment of innovation, right? You need to be hungry to try out new stuff as a, a company which is making money. And uh, so we have limited number of those examples of people who have the confidence uh, to be the creator lead market. So one is the absence of a lead market. Um, the uh, uh, second aspect is the diversity. So in the, uh, since you asked about the academic world, in a class or in research, my research team uh, where I worked with, with a wonderful faculty, the, my major advisor in the US was not from the US. He was from UK uh, and his students represented every part of the world. And that kind of diversity and the ability of people, the best of best, drawing them into uh, a research environment, there is no substitute for that. So we need to reduce the barriers uh, and increase the attractiveness. At least, don't worry about US and UK people coming here. How about people from Sri Lanka more? How about people from Thailand? How about people from Vietnam? Uh, how about people from the Middle East? How about people from Africa? These are all wonderful people. They have great heads on their shoulders. Create a diversity ecosystem in the region. And uh, that, is, that is the most important reason why US is uh, uh, innovative. They got all their innovations from immigrants. Did I answer your question, Hiranmay? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think what you mentioned is right that it has to add more diversity. And the first point that you told, hunger of the ecosystem, I think that's very important because how many of our industry in the vicinity are ready to take if anything is coming up the self in the lab is very important. And there in my subsequent question to Dr. Gobi, you have led this Jack Wilk Center in GE and one of the largest uh, research center of a large corporation outside their parent uh, home, uh, you have seen researchers working and we also come across many literature in which say, it says that the patent filing from poor dollar investment from Indian is as equally good as any other in any, any global research foundations or any other platforms across. So uh, maybe I think there is a gap, how do we convert that research into product? Productization yeah. of the research. So, let me let me add to what you're saying, Iran. My yes, we do great research. We produce great outcomes, and in the right environment, like the John F. Elch Technology Center, uh, it's also complete. But for most part, I need to give you this information, and for the audience, having a patent is of no use uh, unless it is part of a portfolio. You cannot create a product based on one patent. Any product worth its salt, you will see, is based on portfolio of patents. Um, and there, there is also uh, something called standard essential patents, which uh, companies like Qualcomm uh, build their lives around. We don't even want to get there yet. But even for creating patents which matter, even the best of best patents will be much more effective when it stands in a portfolio. So you have to create a patent ticket as an individual or as a company, uh, as a startup even, uh, don't go for the numbers, don't go for isolated great patents. Think about a strategy to create a patent ticket. It is difficult to break through that. Wonderful. I think that's what many academicians miss uh, because we do these standalone patents and, and let them abandon at some point of time. It becomes only a CV point or a ranking parameter but then it does not translate into a product and that's, that's quite important in that sense. So, uh, so one, one question, uh, Dr. Gopi, is uh, in India, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of, I mean, if I quote researchers, there are many multinational companies who now made a research center in India. A lot of people uh, like you are championing that. How do you see hungriness or how do you see uh, the hunger of Indian industries to innovate, who have a predominant uh, 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 contribution to our economy. 
so the indian industry has a long way to go <laughs> so so we have we have a long way to go even uh, the uh, largest of large companies uh, will take an investment risk they will invest in some company with billions of dollars uh, outside of the country uh, which is a huge risk without understanding many things we will go and invest but to invest in technology in your country uh, they will uh, act very smart and uh, ask 2000 questions and uh, in the end not invest so uh, the uh, the the um, the gap in terms of how much investment is required from the industry to where we need to be is huge wonderful uh, before i uh, request nagarjun sir to give uh, the summary of the conversation we have with this concluding you know, i have one question uh, dr gopi you have been veteran in research innovation and and leading big companies what inspired you to come back and start something uh, is there a formula what is the key no formula but uh, of course i have been asked by my colleagues many times why i am not starting something on my own um, always that was because i was able to optimize my sweet spot wherever i was what is that sweet spot it is the intersection of technology people and india and i was optimizing that uh, uh, all uh, whatever decision i took uh, even when i went to the us it was to learn to come back uh, when i came back it was to contribute um, and contribute uh, 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 for jobs as well as for the region when i moved to the tatas again it was to optimize that even further when i decided to do the startup Uh, it was for the same reason that um, probably at this point of time in my career my biggest contribution will be in the startup ecosystem wonderful such a nice clarity of thought in life how to find out the sweet spot how to find out that intersection and also how to keep moving a step forward and this is what nagarjun sir also tells me he says that his sweet sweet spot in life is technology impact and policy so uh, uh, mr nagarajan uh, i now uh, i would like to uh, you to sum up the conversation and give us your concluding remarks yeah thank you arun my that was a very wonderful session i think among all the takeaways the last sentence is going to be that finding your sweet spot is going to be that key takeaway i think for all of us uh, because uh, as i mentioned earlier uh, entrepreneurship is about finding yourself so first you have to find uh, what is the thing that you are truly excited about that makes you in the flow and then you contribute and bring the best out of it and uh, i think uh, it's time to extend a very warm uh, thanks to uh, dr gopichand for his uh, very excellent rounded speech where he covered all areas of innovation and startup and also how things could be made more meaningful and also for the impact of society and of course going local for vocal is also part of our vision and mission and uh, bringing diversity is also the uh, part of it because uh, even this session is now is being watched by people in all talukas uh, in tribal areas in interior areas in very hard to reach areas also we have professors who are holding the flag of innovation and startup in their own areas so we are trying to support them through i hub and inspire them to do their best work and we also start uh, talk about when we talk about startup we many times talk about impact unicorns in i hub we always keep mentioning you the best way to measure uh, the value of your startup is through its impact is it free and yes sir so so in i have we talk about impact unicorns uh, the best way to measure the valuation of your startup is uh, about your impact and money will naturally follow yes and if you are a startup in india you should really keep it keep that in mind so value oriented entrepreneurship is also something we keep uh, Uh, pushing into the minds of uh, the young people here who are the students and innovators in that series i think your talk is also as ordered added a very interesting dimension and also good insights into it so thank you so much for joining us today uh, it has been a great pleasure and uh, uh, we learnt a lot from you and we hope to be in touch with you and also engage you in our further uh, uh, endeavors thank you so much thank you Thank you uh, so much, uh, Nagarjun sir. Thank you so much, Gopi, and your entire team in the office who uh, helped us to get things going. I mean, your backend team was kind enough to get things going, and I'm sure this session was viewed across universities and all the innovation centers. We'll also uh, share this video among all startups, and, and this this session will be widely watched. And your thought, your thought process, the the way you synthesize the conversation and the philosophy uh, that you put forward before us. 
I think that is going to inspire Gopi. I mean, I expect, it's been long since you landed in Ahmedabad to inspire us, but that's COVID. <laughs> I'll be there. I'll be there. Fine. Let, think, go, uh, let COVID uh, pass. I'll come. Uh, for us. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste.